Approximately three years ago, something happened to me that was an event of an unbelievable nature. The terror I had experienced couldn't possibly have its equal. I was fortunate to have survived. I hope that the retelling of it does not cause you distress. To be honest, I'm not eager to recount this. For my own sanity, but it's something I must speak on. Or risk losing that same sanity by keeping it chained up in the privacy of my mind. So... Let me begin. In the autumn of 1925, just one month before we would lose nearly 70 lives in the sinking of HMS M1 in the English Channel, I was stationed in the Royal Artillery Barracks within Greenwich, London, set to be pushed out to Scotland to another station. A Scottish winter wasn't something I was keen on, wasn't exactly the Algarve string winter in London, but I can tell you that Scotland can be a tad rough in the winter, and the weather, at best, unpredictable. Bad to very bad, and back around again. I made the last rounds at the pub for a final day off, provided to our group by Lieutenant Colonel Blackwood, our direct CO in his kindness. The lads and I polished the bar tops with the sleeves of our coats until the wee hours and then two hours of sleep, before we boarded the bus. It was a long way and a cold journey. I slept crook-necked against the window for the nine-hour trek under a pile of coats in a woolen blanket. The itch of the wool must have kept me awake for nearly half the trip, but without it, I'd be vibrating from the chill. Anyhow, I digress. Perhaps inadvertently wasting time, I suppose. Sergeant Diaz seated next to me, and I played a bit of low-stakes poker for part of the ride until we had arrived at Campbell Barracks, east of Inverness near the ancient Culloden battlefield. Pouring out of the bus, we were guided to our barracks and took whatever spaces were given to us. We met a few of the boys during dinner and learned that they were from various places across the UK, with many from Northern Ireland since the split a few years prior. They were quite loyal to Queen and Country for the most part. The food was terrible. I didn't expect much, but it was enough to bring about collective laughs from the rest of the table. Corporal Arnold spoke up. Well, since you're new, may I ask, have you heard about the shadows of Culloden? Essentially ghosts, but black specters that lurk across the battlefield since the 1700s. I smiled wryly, waiting for the punchline. <laughs> no, Corporal. I've not heard about the, the ghouls of Inverness. Do they steal babies in the night, or creep up through the wet moors? <laughs> I replied sarcastically, with the assumption that we were all in agreement at the comedy of the moment. With a slight smile for my comfort, Arnold corrected the levity, and pushed into a full seriousness with his advanced grimness. Yeah, I agree that it sounds ridiculous, Sergeant. However... There's been a surplus of tales over the year by credible folks, including some of our own, that bid testament to the existence of figures, blacker than black, contrasting against the darkest night, even when the moon is shielded by black clouds in the night sky. Some that have been out when they should not have recounted the sharp figures of men, black as emptiness against the veil of night. He narrated as I kept the slightest of grins to tether myself to the safe side of the joke, should it become one after and ensure that I was not the butt of it. Yet, I leaned onto my palm and listened intently, as to at least provide the storyteller the respect of finishing his tale. The sighting of them, as terrifying as they were, to see black shapes of men lumbering across the fields, even if we commit to the idea of ghosts or specters being Wisps of vapor, not solid lines cut through the night. No, as terrifying as they were. The most heart-stopping premise connected to their existence were the disappearances of a dozen or more of the local townspeople into thin air. You see, 
When some more daring thrill-seeking types decided to investigate for a thrill, or to erase the delusions of the so-called fairy tales, they were seen heading to the fields, and never found. Not a trace after that night. Search efforts were all for naught, because there was no logical reason for the disappearance of people that had no connection and disappeared at different times over the years. The thought of investigating was a collective headache. My wife's father was one. He raved about the loss of his co-worker, my wife had told me. Said that he felt helpless, nobody was doing anything, and he went out for days searching every acre, but came up with nothing. Frustrated and zombie-like each dinner, from the stress and despair of no resolve, my wife would tell me that he went further into colored in fields, and knowing that he'd never do a proper search and make it back in time, he was determined to stay overnight in a small tent. It was never seen again. Tent found, pitched in a clearing in the forest, but old Duncan became a cautionary tale for ghosts and goblins, specters and ghouls. So, you see, Sergeant, whether it's laughable or something to take gravely, it is what it is, and the suspicions have mysterious merit. And even if they've got no gravity to me, psychologically, I wouldn't be able to bear the weight of the neurosis or the creeps. For the sake of my reputation, let's just characterize it as discomfort. Finished, Arnold. Whew, well now. I exhaled. I suppose I'll... Just avoid the boogeyman of Culloden. I certainly wouldn't want to be transported to the nether abyss. Who would explain to my wife that I hadn't left her in the most dramatic way possible? <laughs> After a series of afternoon drills into dusk, we were left to complete our individual cleaning assignments. Mine being the food hall wiping down and mopping, which certainly was a fortunate turn considering Arnold was stuck with emptying the latrines and wiping down the walls and seating areas. Around 9 p.m. we turned in, engaged in a bit of lively banter in our bunks and slowly shushed one another so that we could be ready for that cold morning wake up at 5 a.m. for training exercises in the freezing mud. Took a hardened sort out here. I looked forward to the summer unless we would be moved out. Luckily, after my stint in the military, I had a good five years of peace and quiet until I was pulled back in for the fight against the German terror. But that story is for another time, and at the risk of exaggeration, not as interesting. Truly. There were six of us packed into a jeep with a jeep following with our equipment. We were being sent out to a training space just three kilometers away into the bush at the edge of the moors. Arnold explained during the journey that the land was ideal for our training due to the variety of marshland and jagged rock from the nearby outcrop to provide us with the harshest setting for exercises. Well, in, in so many words, anyway. We spent hours crawling through waist-high freezing cold marsh, climbing, sheer outcropping, and getting tree branches whipped across our faces. This continued for days, then weeks. The weather was getting colder as winter approached. This didn't halt or even slow our training exercises near the famed Culloden Fields. The ghosts had company anyway. At least this amused us and drew eye-rolling from Arnold who continued to perpetuate more fables of blacker-than-night figures roaming the moors, snatching up wayward souls. He even added another layer to the narrative that includes sightings, along with a healthy dressing of exaggeration, of a giant that roamed the area, one covered in hair and wailed into the wind on some nights. We were really enjoying our nighttime stories, laying in the dark. The tales were a nice change from the football banter. Giants and wraiths occasionally replaced the feud between the resident supporters of Arsenal and Huddersfield Town. It was on the first Wednesday of December, 1925, that I made a terrible mistake. One that led me into an unimaginable horror, and one that made me regret every joke I ever made after each of the cautionary tales told as absurd fantasy. 
Nearing 1,600 hours on that Wednesday, our drills were taking their toll on us, and with the sun beginning to dip soon, we were told that there was an emergency back at the barracks, as our commanding officer, Corporal Kirby, had suffered a heart seizure. We had one medic with us at exercises, as was the protocol due to the potential danger of the drills, but mostly due to the cuts and bruises often experienced. He was needed back immediately. Instead of sending a car for him, solely, they knew the fastest route back was for him to race back immediately, taking one of the jeeps with him. That left us with one. And with Major Robertson intent on us completing the cycle we had begun, we were stuck there for at least the final hour. The medic, with the only radio, said that they would send a couple more jeeps to us to bring us back shortly. We were quietly satisfied with this solution, and with the three weeks of break after this final day, to join our families for the holidays, we were in good enough spirits to finish up our drills and wait for the jeep. Six of us, including Major Robertson, were never making it back that night. In fact, only I ever returned. Corporal Arnold Major Robertson, Sergeant Diaz, Corporals Henderson and Milner, and I finished up our half-hearted drill and packed up our equipment and stuffed it into the one Willis that we had remaining. Left enough room for a driver. We sat nearby on a patch of grass, back up against the tires. We stayed that way until dark. We had no calms, and until then we weren't concerned about not having any. It got cold. Really cold. We knew, somehow, that nobody was coming now. Things must have gotten bad with Kirby for them to have forgotten us. We had nothing that would help us in our bags. Just equipment. Spades, shovels, rifles, targets, etc. Certainly nothing that we could use for the cold. We had been ordered to stay by Robertson and Arnold, but Diaz, Henderson and Milner, explained that the best possible solution was for them to hoof it to the base and come back with the jeep. After some clever negotiating, the cold was getting to us all, and Robertson allowed them to make the move and go back. Then there were three. Me, Robertson, and Arnold stayed back to watch the jeep and wait for our ride. The three men off on their rescue mission were never heard from again. Disappeared. Weeks later, items of clothing were found, but the men had vanished. I have a good idea where, but I never told a soul. I paced a bit to keep warm. We had a bit of lunch left. One sandwich and a tin that wasn't eaten because Milner hadn't been feeling well. Flu on coming, he suspected. So around 2100 hours, we began to munch on that. Our three fellow soldiers were far past the expected retrieval time. It wouldn't have taken more than 40 minutes there and 10 minutes back by car, unless they got stuck in the mud or there was an accident. Somehow. We had it. We had decided to dump out some of the equipment, squeeze into the Willis and go back ourselves. Jesus Christ! Arnold blurted. What is it? I said. Ah, fuck, bastard Henderson. He's got the keys for the jeep! We were truly stuck. More cursing from the other two, punching the air, and commitments of punishment seething through grinding teeth. We somehow knew something was wrong and they were not coming back. We pulled a nylon fly out of one of the duffels to string from the trees for some cover from the most certain rain. It was Scotland, after all. We laid under the awning for some time, far closer than you'd ever expect soldiers to, but under the conditions with the frost setting in and no blankets, we bundled together to keep warm. Arnold cursing under his breath the whole time, vowing some serious repercussions on the men when we finally were taken back. We should have just walked ourselves, but Robertson demanded we stay with the equipment and jeep. Where the devil are they? uttered Robertson. The bastards abandoned us, replied Arnold. I remained quiet. They were my peers, and I preferred to not bury them yet, but I was becoming equally as agitated. We fell asleep, eventually. I awoke, subtly. One eye, then two. The light snoring of my compatriots was enough to mask the sound that I heard. I knew I had heard. A groan that came from the tree line.
then the sound of branches being brushed by. I slowly lifted my head, and even slower, moved it towards the direction of the forest depths where the sound came from. Clearly the groan of the wind and the breeze moving the foliage. Then I saw it. I think I saw it. It was nearly impossible to focus yet in the black of the forest interior. A slightly darker figure stood, unmoving. Still, I peered and traced the shape of a human figure. Startled by the abrupt cough of Arnold in his sleep that stopped my heart. I looked back and the figure had been gone. I urged the men to wake. I explained that someone was watching us and that we should move. Torches alight and directed towards the woods but nothing except some branches bouncing about. That now useless jeep did have our rifles, shovels, and other equipment that we pulled out as our neurosis grew. If I was seeing things, well, I've just disrupted the night and caused a bit of stress with my group. Yanking out two rifles, a torch, and a shovel, we started moving on the muddy road towards the camp. A 3.4 kilometer hike back over the hills and through open fields in the biting wind and cold. Our teeth were audibly chattering as we moved down the dirt road, rubbing our chests and arms. Our light shone gruesomely across the mist in the air, creating a vaguely lit wall of air and back down to the road, where we could see the final tire tracks of the other boys' exit out of here. Hold! insisted Robertson, arm up. What is it? Shh! He slowly gestured his index finger forward pointed off to the side of the road up ahead. As we pointed the torches away, we could see two red glowing orbs in the distance, maybe 25 meters away, like two glowing red eyes. No, not eyes. Brake lights, car lights. We slowly approached it with our lights pointed in every possible direction, cautiously. I know that I heard sounds around us, but they were hard to explain, nearly inaudible. Low, but I knew they were there. The rest heard nothing and marched forward towards the strange lights. It was the jeep. Our jeep. At least one of ours. What was it doing out here? Running. In a field in the middle of nowhere. There was a heaviness in the air. We walked around the Willis. Definitely ours. Wait. This is ours. Ours, ours. This is the same jeep that the guys left on. I knew the numbers, and it had two duffel bags in the back that we had packed earlier in the day. Where were they? Lads, where are you? Shouted Arnold. I instantly placed my hand on his arm to quiet him. I don't know why I did this. He looked at me confused and feeling a bit invaded, but he needed to stop yelling into the void. Something was not sitting right with me. I clutched my shovel, wishing I had the rifle. Those were in the arms of the superior officers. We slowly backed away from the jeep. We continued to search the area quietly with our torches, but there was no one. Not even footsteps in the mud. Just this vehicle slid off the main road. His tracks were obvious. We tried to get the car out, but its tires were buried in the mud. They spun and spun, and the two lads got in front and pushed while I accelerated, but even these tough terrain tires were not making any progress. It was useless. I turned off the engine and walked away. The blackness engulfed it as we moved away with our light. We continued walking again, now more confused than we were when we set out. I looked back into the distance and saw the tiny and dim red lights in the night, with the fading headlights casting a glow into the field in front of it. I turned off the engine myself. There was no way the jeep should be on with its lights on. Then for a moment, I thought I saw a movement in that glow. It stopped me for a moment. I was so unsure of what I saw that I didn't feel comfortable shouting out for a possible fellow 
soldier. And the movement made a rapid appearance for a split second in the lights, and then the lights went out. The jeep died. I didn't say anything to the other men. I didn't want to add to their growing stress. We had made it nearly a kilometer back, following the road, until again we were forced to stop. The road ended. I mean, there was nothing ahead but a wall of black. Shining our lights forward, the blackness ate our light. It was shocking. Arnold walked towards it, his beam of light getting shorter as he approached it, disappearing into the opaque. We felt we must have been seeing things. We heard sounds to the left and right of us, and as we turned to look, more blackness curved around us in an arc. Then, as I turned to the others to shout to move back, Arnold was gone. He was nowhere around us. Gone. We shouted to him. Arnold! 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 We frantically searched around the edge of the black. Then, we backed away as we heard a booming sound come from the direction of the opaque wall, like horns of evil. They boomed and boomed and were deafening. We fell to the ground, clutching our ears. Then we ran back, away from the devastating sound and impassable wall. We ran through the night. Eventually, without stopping, we were back at the training space. We didn't stop there. We skipped past the jeep and headed towards the moors. We needed to find a way around, and if we could get across the moors and through the bog, there was a town about six kilometers away, called Cumberland. And before that, the Culloden Inn. We were too afraid to be cold, and we marched on. We could hear those horns behind us far into the distance. We reached the infamous Culloden Fields, the haunted grounds of the 1746 battle. Somehow this felt worse. This felt ominous. A fog suddenly illuminated our surroundings hovering waist-high above the ground. The horns were gone. Now, silence. Terrible, chilling silence. With the exception of our footsteps making sucking sounds as we pulled our boots out of the muck, accompanied by the howling wind. We were in the center of a large moor, an uncultivated tract of land that was once the scene of a violent exchange. The moon was large and looming. The wind was penetrating our bones, and the mud was attempting to pull our boots off with every step. Off somewhere. I swear I heard screams of men. Men in pain. Terror. Robertson heard it also. We thought it might be one of our boys. Arnold, Milner, Henderson, or Diaz. We called out to them immediately, but as we did, it went silent again. Suddenly, in our stupor, we leapt with our hearts smashed in our chest as we heard cannon fire. This was not right. The screams of agony and rage began again amidst the cannon blasts echoing in the distance. What we only just then uncovered from beneath the cannon fire was the sound of rifles. These were muskets. My grandfather had an antique one that he fired for me as a child. He let me have it, and although I used it on round pebbles only, I knew the sort of sound of the flint powder and shot. Muffled in its firing, but loud. It was now enveloping us from all sides. As we picked up our pace and began to move forward with true intent on getting out of the moor, we heard groans. Very clearly. Closer. Very close. Pain. I spun around to see something blacker than night wrench its hands around Robertson's neck and yank him to the ground. When I reached for him, whatever it was, this specter, this demon, this, this ghoul, it pulled him off into the blackness of the beyond in the blink of an eye. I gasped screamed, Robertson! and knowing that I was helpless, I started running in the frustrating pull of the mud, 
which slowed me down until I reached patches of frozen grassland. The screams and munitions continued to permeate the wind as I tore off. I stopped before the tree line to look back. Dozens upon dozens of figures began to emerge from the ground. Dark figures pulling up from the muddy soil and standing, crooked, bent, and with a position of malice, like they were ready to launch after me. I didn't wait. One last look at the ghoulish army to my aft and I ran as quickly as I could into the forest. I heard the snapping of twigs around me as I ran. I was being gassed, quickly. Running out of oxygen, exhausted. There came the point of this evil pursuit that I had dropped onto the moss trying to catch my breath and finding it impossible, despite all my efforts, to remain silent. Gasping and gulping air as much as I could. The fear and fatigue of breathlessness would have knocked anyone else out. But I trained in fear and fatigue. I picked myself up, still chugging oxygen, and lumbered forward in the dark, torch still in hand, but fading quickly. Those things were to my rear and sides. So I pushed forward, yet accepted my fate even if I didn't want to. Finally up ahead, there it was. In a clearing, upon a narrow road lay the Culloden Inn, a small pub and boarding house that I had been told of by the lads when I arrived. It was notably bright green in color. It was a usual drinking spot for any of the soldiers that wanted a nearby night out. The lights were on, and falling and picking myself up I got to the door, and I banged at it. Looking back. The figures emerged from behind trees, not having given up on their chase. I was honestly shocked. I knew it wasn't my imagination, but I had assumed, in some optimism, that after leaving the moors, they would have left me alone. An old man answered, What's all this racket? What's wrong with you, lad? He said. Please, let me in. Someone's chasing me. I replied. He moved aside and I fell to the rug on the floor, panting still. He slammed the door behind me. I crawled up to a chair while the innkeeper just stared at me. Footsteps creaking down the stairs. An older lady... Presumably the innkeeper's wife asking about the noise and what's happened. He looked up at her. Hey, they're back again, Agnes. Turn off the lights. Lock the windows. At this moment, the lights went out, and I was covered in complete darkness. Then the sound of iron slipping into iron as the door was bolted. We remained quiet as the moans and cries began to envelop the inn.